recording. We are now recording. Oh, am I ever glad I keep remembering to hit record. There are the times when you forget, and then you have to do the whole thing over again. Anyway, <laughs> by myself. Uh, we will continue where we left off. Last week, we talked a bit about the middle ear. Today, we will complete our discussion on the middle ear. And we're working our way pretty well through this course, because then we start looking at the inner ear. When we finish the anatomy portion of the inner ear, it's time for a midterm. And uh, we're good still for a, few, for a couple of weeks yet. We'll spend this week to finish the middle ear. We'll spend two weeks more on the anatomy of the inner ear. Then we'll have the midterm. So it's like three weeks from now, something like that. Where we left off, if I can share a screen here, and talk about where we left off. We were talking lots about this as we just finished things. And I think it's amazing kind of how the two courses jumped together. Right here, I think this is one of the last slides we showed last week. And it may have seemed kind of Greek to you at that time, but having just learned a bit about the decibel in acoustics class a few minutes ago, where have you seen this graph before? It's a lot the same as the pressure graph that we were looking at in dynes per centimeter squared. Here you're not, we're just looking at the pressure increase. I didn't draw 0 0.0002 over here. I just called that no pressure increase, increasing the pressure by 10, increasing the pressure by another 10, which is 100, by 10, by 10, by 10, and by 10. Okay? And we were talking about what the middle ear does. What's its purpose? What's it for? And when you're looking at a slide like this, we covered a few things in this slide. We said, first of all, we said that the eardrum, look at the eardrum, is way bigger than the size of the footplate of the stapes fitting into the oval window. The three middle ear bones. Looking at this particular picture here to highlight that yet again. The large size of the drum compared to the small size of the footplate of the stapes. And that is largely, that's the first way that the middle ear increases sound pressure going into the cochlea because the cochlea is filled with fluid. The second way was because the long process of, or the malleus is a little bit longer than the incus bone, just a tad longer. You'll see this malleus here, a little bit longer than the incus. And like a teeter-totter or a seesaw, we looked over here. One's a little bit longer than the other. And then the third thing we mentioned about the ear is that the eardrum doesn't move all together in one uniform motion. It buckles a bit, as you can see by the dotted lines. And that's the third way that the middle ear increases pressure. So summarizing it, eardrum to stapes size, ossicles to leverage action, eardrum buckling action. We said the eardrum is 17 times larger than the stapes, 1.3 times to 1 times longer than the incus, the malleus is. The buckling action, multiply those guys together. You've got a pressure increase of 44 to 1. And then you put it on this particular graph, and you will see that a tenfold increase is a 20 dB increase. If you increase the pressure by 100 times, you've gone up 40 decibels. And well, what the middle ear does is it increases the pressure by 44 to 1 when you factor all these things together. And 44 to 1 is somewhere between 10 and 100. And we said last week when you do the math, that corresponds to somewhere between 30 and 35 decibel increase offered by the middle ear. And a really good way to demonstrate this action, what it is and what it does, is if you were to hit a tuning fork, and I don't have one here because it's over at my other office, but if you ding a tuning fork and you hold it against the bone, put your finger on the bone behind your ear, you'll feel that rounded bone, and you put sound in that, you put a tuning fork, and you hold it against that bone, you'll hear through your bone, the bone of your skull. But then if you pull it away and hold the tuning fork by your ear, whoa, it gets way louder. And that whoa, way louder is this increase. 
It's what the middle ear does. Because when you thung the tuning fork and hold it against the bone, you're not involving the middle ear. You're sending sound straight to the inner ear. When you hold it by your ear, you are involving the middle ear. And whoa, it sounds louder. And that's the decibel increase offered by the middle ear. Rather interesting, I think. But then, then again, I'm kind of a nerd that way. So we look a bit of at our, at our uh, notes here. And that tuning fork I was talking about is called the Rene tuning fork test. And it's an eloquent demonstration of what the middle ear adds. It compares a client's own hearing aid by air conduction and by bone conduction. Procedure. You ask a client which tone sounds loudest, when the fork is held next to your outer ear or when the fork is held against your mastoid bone. A normal ear should hear the tone louder when the fork is at the outer ear because you're hearing by air conduction, which goes through the middle ear. Bone conduction itself does not involve the middle ear. So if the tuning fork was not louder by the outer ear, you would be said to have a middle ear problem, a middle ear pathology. So which two populations are going to hear the tone loudest when held by the ear? Normal hearing people and people who have sensory neural hearing loss, hearing loss due to the cochlea, because they don't have anything wrong with the middle ear. Anyone who has no problem with the middle ear is going to hear the sound louder when it's held by the ear than when it's put on the mastoid bone. And this whole section of the page, okay, talks about what we just covered. There's three elements here the area of the tympanic membrane, the leverage action of the middle ear bones, 1.3 to 1, the buckling action of the tympanic membrane, all those together, pressure increase of 44 to 1 or 44 to 2, something like that. And here's the summary of all of this. And the, tuning, the Rene tuning fork test demonstrates this. Now we move to the top of page 3. What is the maximum amount of possible conductive hearing loss? Now, remember, conductive hearing loss is hearing loss due to a physical blockage of sound reaching the cochlea. A physical blockage of sound reaching the inner ear. When we put on earplugs, when we mow the lawn, we are giving ourselves a conductive hearing loss on purpose. So think of a conductive hearing loss as a plug in the ear. Whether the plug is an ear plug, whether the plug is wax in the outer ear canal, whether the plug is middle ear infection, doesn't matter. The point is conductive hearing loss is a physical, mechanical blockage of the conduction of sound going through to the inner ear. Now, I'm going to close the door here so my better half doesn't have to hear me barking and yakking on a computer here. Hang on. There we go. alley -oop. Okay. So, reading this now, maximum conductive hearing loss, however, is often very much more than what the middle ear adds. It's more than 25 to 30 dB. You can have like a 60 decibel conductive hearing loss. If the middle ear makes up about 33 decibels, then how come a conductive hearing loss can be more than that? That's the question. Okay? And you know what? Just so you know this, there's a lot of audiologists with their AUD degrees that can't answer that question. I'm serious as a heart attack. There's a lot of people out there practicing. If, if the middle ear makes up 30 to 35 decibels, if that's what that Rene tuning fork, whoa, louder demonstrates, how can a conductive hearing loss be greater than that? And basically, this is the reason. We'll show you a picture. Every picture tells a story, don't it? All right, here we go. If the middle ear makes up some 30 to 35 decibels, then why can a conductive hearing loss be more than that? The reason is this. 
when the oval window indents, the foot plate of the stapes pushes into the oval window, the cochlea filled with fluid bulges the round window out. You have to have that trading action in order for the middle ear to be working properly. So when the oval window pushes in, the round window bulges out. If the round window cannot bulge out, however, because let's pretend this middle ear space is filled with pus, ear infection, total ear infection. If this is totally filled with fluid because of an infection, this round window will not budge. And if that round window doesn't, is not enabled to push out, this oval window cannot push in. So if the round window cannot bulge, the oval window cannot indent. Your conductive hearing loss will be greater, greater, greater than 30 to 35. The oval window pushed inward bulges the round window. The round window, if you were to push that, would bulge the oval window. They trade off. Energy to both windows simultaneously, this interaction is gone. So go back to the previous one. Pretend we took out your middle ear ossicles and eardrum. What if sound could just enter through your outer ear canal following my cursor, could go in and not hit this and have go travel through there? What if sound traveled in, let's say we took out your eardrum and took out your middle ear ossicles. Sound would hit your oval and round windows at the same time. You'd get a cancellation then too. So people who have completely damaged middle ear bones, okay, the oval and round window aren't given that interplay interaction. It's only because the eardrum is connected only to the oval window that you get that trading action. There's another pathology of the middle ear called otosclerosis. You will be learning about this in hearing disorders next semester. Okay, Otosclerosis is when bony growth surrounds this foot plate of the stapes. And now the stapes can't push in. So if the stapes can't push in, this round window isn't going to bulge either. That too will cause a greater than 30 to 35 decibel conductive loss. Anyway, just food for thought. Kind of gross, but food. There you go. All right. True, though, put a star by this. The maximum conductive hearing loss that you can measure really depends on the headphone used in the test. So for example, let's say if I took out your middle ear ossicles and your eardrum and put a circumoral headphone around, like a headphone that surrounded your whole ear, the biggest conductive hearing loss I could measure would be around 60 decibels, 60. If I put an insert headphone into your ear canal, then the biggest conductive hearing loss I could measure would be about a 70 to, to 80 decibel, 75 to 80 decibel hearing loss. So again, pretend I ripped out your entire middle ear so you had no middle ear at all. Put a circumoral headphone on, the biggest conductive hearing loss I could measure would be about 60. If I inserted an ear headphone into the, or an insert headphone into your ear canal, the biggest conductive hearing loss I could measure would be around 75 to 80. Which kind of begs the question then, what is truly the biggest possible conductive hearing loss that exists? What is it if it depends on the, on the, the transducer or headphone used to measure it? I don't know. But last time I knew it was illegal to remove someone's middle ear bones and fill your middle ear spaces with cement and find out. It's illegal. So, don't know. But suffice to say, first we now know why the biggest conductive hearing loss you can measure is, big, is more than the 35 decibels offered up by the middle ear. It's because of that trade-off action. And that's essentially what, really what I wanted you to know. Okay, blow that guy up again, back to share screen. We gots to keep up, and otherwise we're going to be nattering about nothing. Okay, the resonances of your middle ear. Your middle ear, just like your outer ear, just like we discussed about the outer ear having a high-frequency resonance. 
the fact that your outer ear canal is an inch long and it's a quarter wave resonator and that it resonates with the high frequencies of the consonants, well, your middle ear is also has mass and stiffness and it too has its own resonances. The middle ear ossicles have a resonance of about 2000 hertz, about 2000 hertz. They like uh, 2000 hertz. There's two other resonant frequencies in the middle ear. The eardrum, the cavity of the middle ear, all of this taken together, you're going to see another resonance around 750 to 900 hertz. You might see another resonance around 1200 hertz. Basically, the middle ear has a high frequency resonance. It's mostly a stiffness dominating dominated system because it doesn't have much mass. It's mostly stiffness. But you recall that the outer ear adds about 20 to 25 dB between 1500 and 4000 hertz. Well, the middle ear also has its own resonances. Ew, where am I going there? Go back, Ted. Okay. The middle ear also has, look at it here, the middle ear's resonance. It resonates between, here's 100 hertz, here's 1000 hertz, and here's all the way to 10,000 hertz. The middle ear has lots of resonances over here. Okay, so when you take the outer ear canal resonance, which we described as this a week or so ago, having a peak between 1500 and 4000 hertz, and here's the outer ear canal. If you look at the screen here, the outer ear canal, here's the concha bowl of the outer ear. Add this resonance and this resonance together, you got this one. And then you take this resonance and you add it to that resonance, and guess what you get? A curve. Our ears are most sensitive to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Five, one, two, and four. Our ears. Um, unlike a dog's ears or a cat's ears, the human hearing system, because of the resonance of your outer ears, because of the resonance of your middle ears, those two resonances, you put them together and you get an uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. Uneven. Remember in acoustics an hour and a half ago, we were talking about the softest you can hear a 1000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears from a speaker. Okay, well, let's play that same experiment. Okay, let's play that. Whoops, go cool, stay back here. Let's play that same experiment across the frequencies. So late we did it first at a thousand hertz. So follow my cursor. A thousand hertz. And then we did it at 2,000 hertz, 4,000 hertz, 8,000 hertz. It really hurts, okay? So we, and you'll find uneven hearing sensitivity. Actually, in, in, if all truth be known, I should lower this down so 1,000 hertz is equal to about zero, shouldn't I? There we go. Now let's look at that picture, okay? Because when we did that experiment at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears, the softest we could hear, we said, oh, that's 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared. We're going to call that zero. Okay, 1,000 hertz, zero. But let's say now we tried that same game with 2,000 hertz. And if we did that at 2,000 hertz, look, our hearing gets a little better than zero because of the resonances. And if we did it at 4,000 hertz, we'd be about the same at 1,000 hertz. But if we played an 8,000 hertz tone from a speaker at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears, look at this, we'd need more dBSPL. And if we went to 500 hertz, and 500 hertz was coming from the speaker at one meter distance with our two ears. The, the, what's the softest it would take for us to just barely hear? We'd require about five decibels. And if we took a 250 hertz tone and played it from a speaker at one meter distance, the softest decibel level required for us to just barely hear would be like 
follow my cursor, about a more than 10, be about 12. If we tried that same experiment with 125 cycles per second, 125 hertz, and played that from the speaker at one meter distance, we'd require about over 25 decibels to just barely hear that tone. So you can see that our hearing is actually uneven across the frequencies. It depends on the frequency. Our ears hear some frequencies more better than other frequencies. Weird, but true. So now, look at this. You've got two lines here. The yellow is, this, is the line we just showed. That's this one. And look at the white curve here. And again, this is your outer ear canal resonance. Here's your middle ear resonance. This plus this equals this. Well, the yellow line is how we hear with two ears. The white line is how we hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. Two ears are better than one. How much better? About 5 dB better. And then all of a sudden you get this bulge here. Those who indulge, bulge. Why this bulge here? Well, that's because now you're plugging up the outer ear with a headphone, so you're losing some of the outer ear canal resonance because you plugged it up. So here you get, the, you get a real loss of hearing sensitivity. But at any rate, the, this curve, this white curve, is called MAP. We'll, discuss, we'll talk much more about that later on in acoustics. I'm just giving you a preview, okay? That's, and this bottom curve, the way we hear with two ears, is called minimal audible field. You don't need to know that for this course, okay? I'm just talking. But MAP, the softest it takes for us to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone, that is called zero decibels HL, hearing level. And that's the zero line on the audiogram where we test hearing. Anyway, we'll go there much later. We'll cover this, all of this again, but I'm just giving you a preview here just to tell you that the outer ear canal resonance and the middle ear resonance, those two, when you put them together, you get uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. That's because of the resonances of our ears. And it's because our, we're human and our ears have this shape. If we were dogs or cats, the whole situation would be different, of course. So anyway, here we go. Back to the notes. Okay. Acoustic reflexes. And this is kind of neat. Don't get too freaked out about this, but the acoustic reflex, what the Sam Hill is an acoustic reflex. They deal with the middle ear for sure, so let's move on down. The acoustic reflex. I'll show you a picture here, and then we'll look at another one. This is a weird picture. Let me explain it to you. Follow my cursor from the left. Ear canal. Eardrum. Middle ear bones, stupid drawing. Malleus, Inca, stapes, here's your stapes bone. And then this weird beehive shaped thing, that's supposedly a cochlea. And then you're going to what they call the brain stem between your ears, which is simply the spinal cord inside your skull. And then there's all these weird lines in between. And now you're looking at the other ear. This is a weird diagram. Let me show you mine. And it gets just as complicated or strange, but have a look at it. I'm going to talk about the acoustic reflex. Now, let's see if I've got this. Oh, yeah, you guys don't. Okay, let me just get you a couple of pictures here. I think what I need to show you is a couple of pictures from your, um, you know, you've got to see the, 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 you've got these two muscles of the middle ear, and I want to show those to you. So in one second, hang on here whilst I take a look-see. I'm going to go into your, your hearing disorders, and let's see, middle ear disorders. Let me see, middle ear, middle ear, middle ear. Maybe I got the picture here. Maybe. Not sure. Just taking a look. Where I could find. No, I don't think I'll have it there. No. 
Okay, I'm going to close that one here. Let me go to show you another picture of the middle ear muscles. This is what I'm trying to find is the middle ear muscles. So let's go into my PowerPoints here. I just want to show you those two muscles because they deal with the acoustic reflex. So tympanometry way down here. I should have had that in this PowerPoint, but you guys do have it in your, in your notes anyway. But let's look at the bones of your, of your middle ear. I should say that the muscles, the two muscles that comprise the middle ear. <laughs> Me wearing an OTC hat. Look at this. <laughs> Canada in the winter time. We don't get much snow where I live, but there's my Ozarks Technical College. with me wearing a weird hat. Believe it or not, we got palm trees in Canada. Just thought I'd show you that. Um, <laughs> getting to the middle ear. Okay, Hew, where was I? Where was I? Did I have it here? Nope. Okay, concept of tympanometry. Work your way down. Acoustic reflexes. What I'm looking for. <laughs> pictures of Greenland, of Iceland, all the stuff you really didn't need to know about that much. <laughs> there. There we go. There's the stapedius muscle attached to the neck of the stapes. See that? Right here. And prior to that, whoops, here is your tensor tympani muscle attached to the manub to the malleus. The two muscles, the tensor tympani and the stapedius. Those two muscles cause your acoustic reflex. So now back over to here, looking at the picture, a loud sound, if it comes in your ear canal, hits your eardrum, goes through your middle ear ossicles, and then follow the arrows, goes into your cochlea, goes up your eighth nerve to your brain stem. And then look at the arrows going back. Your brain stem sends messages to those two muscles. And it tells those two muscles to contract, contract. So one goes down the fifth cranial nerve, out. And the other one goes down the seventh cranial nerve, out. And the seventh cranial nerve ends at the stapedius muscle. The fifth cranial nerve message ends at the tensor tympani muscle. And, the weird, and that <clears throat> causes the acoustic reflex. But the weird thing is, if a loud sound comes in one ear, because everything crosses over in the brain stem, follow the arrows again, loud sound, middle ear, cochlea, eighth nerve, brain stem, guess what? The outgoing messages go to both ears. So a loud sound in this ear causes an acoustic reflex in both ears. A loud sound in this ear, same thing. And it's because of crossover, decussation they call that, crossover taking place in the brain stem. So now let's talk about the acoustic reflex. The tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle. Actually, the stapedius muscle is the strongest of the two. It's the humdinger. It's the little one, but it's the strongest. The tensor tympani muscle is innervated, meaning gets its message to pull from the fifth cranial nerve. Remember, you've got 12 pairs of cranial nerves. 12 pairs, your brain, your spinal cord into your skull is called the brain stem. And off the brain stem, you have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The eighth pair is for hearing, is the auditory one. And the fifth and the seventh are involved with your acoustic reflexes. The seventh cranial nerve also allows you to smile. Okay, if you've got seventh cranial nerve paralysis, you have Bell's palsy. Anyway. The reflex arc, and that reflex arc is what I drew you here. It's that big loop, sound going in, and then the message is going back. That's the acoustic reflex arc. The acoustic reflex arc. Back to here. The acoustic reflexes, they occur in both ears even though only one ear is stimulated. Why? Because of neural decussation. In circle that word decussation, it just means crossover. The acoustic reflex is caused by incoming tones that are over 80 decibels SPL. They're also caused by chewing. 
and by one's own speech. Now think about this. We'll just talk for a second. I'll stop sharing and we'll just gab for a bit. Ever listen to your own voice on a recording? We talked about this before. You ever hear yourself on a recording? Do you like the sound of your own voice on a recording? Nobody does. Okay? All right. But others say, well, that sounds just like you. And you're the only one that says, no, it doesn't. I don't sound like that. God, do I sound like that? Yeah, it sounds just like you. That's because you are hearing yourself by air conduction alone. When you're hearing other people, you're hearing them by air conduction. The sound waves reach your ears through the air. Okay, but when you yourself talk, when you're talking, you hear yourself through the air, but you also hear yourself through the bone. So you hear yourself louder and deeper, more richly, because the mass of your skull resonates with low pitches. So you hear yourself more rounded, louder and richer. When you're listening to yourself in a recording, you sound more tinny and a little bit higher pitched. And so, what did we say earlier in acoustics class? What's the average intensity of ongoing conversational speech? My father can beat your father at checkers. About 60 to 70 decibels, right? How loud do you hear yourself? You hear yourself at around 85 decibels. When you talk, you're louder. And guess what? That's enough to cause your acoustic reflex. That's why you have an acoustic reflex, to dull the loudness of your own voice while you talk. Because when you've got the muscles contracting in that middle ear, the, the middle ear can't move as well. The middle ear is kind of stopped. It's checked from moving very well. That's why you have an acoustic reflex. It's nature's protection against loud sounds too. So when loud sounds come into the ear, the acoustic reflex, <clears throat> and when the acoustic reflex kicks in, share a screen, go back to here. When the acoustic reflex kicks in, we'll just take a peek, take a peek at a picture, okay? Oh, well, we could take, oh, let's go to this one, and then we will go home. Look at this. This isn't showing you the two muscles, but think of the muscle, a muscle attached to the neck of the stapes, that's the stapedius muscle, and think of another muscle attached to this malleus bone. When those two muscles contract, they stop the middle ear from working as well. And that's the acoustic reflex. What causes it? Loud sounds. How loud? Over 80 to 85 decibels. That's how loud. And your own voice, when you hear your own voice, you hear yourself at over 80 decibels. That often kicks in the acoustic reflex. So the acoustic reflex allows you to hear better while you are talking. It dulls the loudness of your own voice. Weird, but true. <laughs> Back to your notes. How much does your acoustic reflex dull the loudness of your own voice? By around 5 to 10 dB. Some people say it's a little more. Some people say it's about 15 to 20 dB. Some people say it's about 14 dB. Whatever. Just say a few decibels. It dulls the loudness of your own voice. And they are most robust for loud, low frequencies. Not loud, high frequencies. So if I put a loud, high frequency tone in my ear, I won't get much of an acoustic reflex. But if I put a loud, low frequency tone in, I will. Now, why is that the case? Think about it. Vowels of speech are louder and lower than consonants of speech. When I start to talk really loud, I'm emphasizing the vowels, the, the, the voice sounds. And voiced speech is much louder than the letters s, t, h, k, k, p, p. Those sounds aren't very loud. The loud parts are the lower frequency parts. And the lower frequency parts of speech are your sounds that come from your throat. Now, I stop sharing, and just to make this make sense, put your hand to your throat, 
and say ah, uh, say hmm, say uh, mm, nah, ooh, ah. You are. Can you feel it vibrate? Now say the letter ch. Did it vibrate? Uh uh. Say the letter s. Didn't vibrate. Say the letter f. Didn't vibrate. Sounds that make your throat vibrate are louder and lower. So all the letters of the alphabet that use this, M, M, D, U, A, those are louder and lower in pitch. And those are what the acoustic reflex is focusing on because that's the loudest parts of speech. If I say the word speech, E is the loudest part that isn't very loud. If I say the word church, what's the loudest part? Er, the ch isn't very loud. Okay, so acoustic reflexes are most robust for low frequencies. Enough on that. Next, share screen. Okay, don't freak about uh, all of this, this, this stuff in here, la, 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 all the details. Memorize or just think about from the way we've been talking in this Zoom session. That's the kind of stuff you need to know for your quizzes, midterms, and final. Don't freak about the numbers too much. But if I do say I have a question on a, fit, on a midterm or a quiz, acoustic reflexes dull the loudness of your boy, voice by 50 decibels. True or false, you better say false. Because 50 is a lot more than 15. Dig? Good. All right. Just major common sense. That's what I need you to know. A common misconception is that acoustic reflexes are nature's protection against loud sounds. They are. I shouldn't say completely not true, but the main purpose is they reduce the loudness of your own voice while you are talking. Recall from acoustics, low frequency vowels are louder than high frequency consonants. See what you're looking at here on your typewriting? You'd think I'd written this. Okay, average conversational speech heard from others by air conduction is about 65 dB SPL. Our own voices to ourselves is much louder because we hear ourselves by air and bone conduction. And that's enough to cause an acoustic reflex. Acoustic reflexes are most robust for the low frequencies. Low frequency vowels contribute most to the loudness of our voices. There you go, in print from what I said earlier. Ah, take a breather. Mona, take a break. All right, we are on the winding final end of the middle ear. Okay? Good. We've covered a bunch of stuff. We covered the anatomy of the middle ear. Then we covered the physiology, what it does, how it does it. And what it does is increases sound pressure. We talk about the three ways that it does that. Then we covered the acoustic reflex and what it's for. These are all things that the middle ear does. Now let's look at some disorders of the middle ear. And you will cover those again in a course called um, 125. In your 125 course, it's specifically on hearing disorders. But we'll just take a preview here, just for the fun of it. I know you like it. All right, here we go. Have a sip. All right. Yeah, they're going to fire me if anybody from if any, if any political import at OTC watches these Zoom sessions. I'm going to get a phone call saying, okay, we are sorry, but we can't keep you. You may be Canadian, but you don't deserve to be teaching at our college. All right, here we go. Otitis media is the big one. Otitis media. Oto is ear. Itis is infection or inflammation. And media is middle. Middle ear infection. And it's got stages to it, like chapters of a book. If you read from the top here, Chapter one, kid gets sore throat, gets a cold, gets the flu. Much like Ariane has got right now. Okay, that person's got problems with the thing, so they got a sore throat. Sore throat means swollen tonsils. When the tonsils are swollen, no new air can come up this eustachian tube. Because remember, the eustachian tube is like a government office. Closed unless forced open, okay? Like a lot of banks. So it's when you station tube opens when you swallow. 
So when you swallow, it cracks open for a second and it allows new air to get in here because this is always absorbing oxygen. The mucus lining of the middle ear space is always absorbing oxygen. So if you don't get new air coming up in here, you're gonna get a vacuum, much like this. Okay, your middle ear is gonna suck inward. Your eardrum will suck inward. So let's follow the stages of otitis media, mostly seen in children. Sore throat, your station tube doesn't open, vacuum in the middle ear space. All right, let's move on down to see what that might look like. Okay, I'm going to go down to see where we get to this little kid's face, because I'm going to show you something about little kids. Kids get earaches more than adults do. And the reason why is because in ch children, the eustachian tube is more horizontal. In adults, the eustachian tube is more diagonal. If you look at the, here's a little kid, look at the eustachian tube going to the, his throat. It's fairly horizontal. That's because adult faces are longer, children's faces are more squat. And that's why as a teenager, you grow out of ear infections because your face gets longer. Just FYI. Now, if we get out of this and go back to our notes, upper respiratory infection, your station tube won't open when you swallow. Vacuum results in closed middle ear. Oh, vacuum has only one C, Ted, not two. Okay. Vacuum results in closed middle ear space. Eardrum is sucked inward, causing pain. Next, serous fluid fills the middle ear space and the tympanic membrane bulges outward. Let's see if we can find what that looks like. Here's a normal eardrum. So when you're looking at the normal eardrum, you can see the manubrium of the malleus, the incus bone a little bit, pieces of the stapes bone, cone of light here. We talked about that before. Here's a retracted eardrum, stage two of otitis media. Here is serous fluid behind the eardrum. This is the body's reaction against this. When this happens, the body says, uh-uh, can't have that. So it produces fluid. And now your eardrum is, now it's bulging. And then I say serous, so here's that word, S-E-R-O-U-S, meaning non-infected. It's like the fluid under a blister. It's clear non-infected. Later on, however, that fluid turns white. Now it's pus. Now you've got pus-filled middle ear space, otitis media, causing a bigger than 30 to 35 decibel conductive loss because now the oval and round windows can't alternate anymore. The pus is filling the whole middle ear space. So if you're looking at that whole middle ear space is filled with pus, the whole eardrum is bulging out, hurts like Hades, okay, not nice. So then we work our way down to look at those pathologies here. And, a, and what people often do is they will insert a tube into the eardrum. And the reason this is done is to allow new air to come into the middle ear space. There's three populations of children. One population of kids doesn't get much ear infection, just genetic, they just don't get much. Another population of children gets ear infections a few times, maybe three or four times, and then grows out of it. And then there's a third population which gets chronic, repeated, otitis media. And it's that third group. It's that third group that often is given tubes. It's a tube is put into the eardrum. They make a hole in the eardrum and stick a tube in to keep it open. It grows out after a while. It falls out after a couple of months and the hole heals by itself. But those tubes, you know what it's done? It's saying, screw that. If the back door don't work, if the, I should say, if this door here don't work, 
If the front door doesn't work, then heck with it. We're gonna use, we're gonna play with the back door. We're gonna make a back door and let the new air in. Come hell or high water, we're gonna let new air get into that middle ear space. So instead of using antibiotics after antibiotics after antibiotics, because we're growing immune to our antibiotics, as you may know, this is a non-medicinal way to get around otitis media and allow air to get into that middle ear space because if the eustachian tubes are constantly malfunctioning and not letting new air up into the middle ear space, well then by gum we're going to make another door to allow new air to get in there. And these are called pressure equalizing tubes. Here's what otitis media will look like on a hearing test. Okay, here's what it will look like on a hearing test. You haven't studied hearing testing much, have you? But let's look at it. Here's your frequencies across the top. 125, 250, 500, 1,000 hertz, 2,000, 4, and 8. Here's decibels going down the page. Okay? This flat zero line is really that curve of uneven hearing sensitivity. They build that curve into the audiometer and they call the whole ding dong thing zero. Anyway, so these numbers represent decibels hearing level. So the X's represent the child's left ear, the O's represent the child's right ear. And you can see that otitis media is causing about a 40 to 50 decibels conductive hearing loss. Notice how it goes up here at 2,000. That's because the middle ear ossicles resonate at 2,000 hertz. But the neat thing is these hatch marks at the top. That's because when they take the headphones off and they put an oscillator on the mastoid bone with a headband and they play the tones that way, you're avoiding the outer ear, you're working around the middle ear, and guess what? The child hears like a baby, requiring no more than zero to maybe five decibels to just barely hear. So we go, ah, your cochlea is working fine, but you've got a blockage. When I put the headphone on, you have a hearing loss. When I test you through the bone, you hear normally. Conductive hearing loss, otitis media. Here's another middle ear pathology, but just a sec. Let's make sure we've covered otitis media. Look at the chapters. Clear serous fluid. Serous fluid becomes pus filled. Look at this mastoiditis. Ooh, well, look at the picture here in PowerPoint. The roof of your middle ear space. Let's go, let's go to the, the, your PowerPoint here and we'll go home here. The roof of your middle ear space is an eighth of an inch from your brain. Look closely. And all the bone around here is soft, porous mastoid bone. So now the infection comes out of the, not only do you have the infection of your middle ear, but it infects, look at this porous bone here. Now this mastoid bone begins to become infected. It's got all little holes in it. And the bone here, that's your mastoid bone. It's got all holes in it. And those holes, it's because it's very porous. And those get infected. Now you're screwed because now antibiotics is not going to do you any good. They used to do a mastoidectomy. They would literally burr away that whole bone. They would have to remove parts of your middle ear. Better that than getting the sixth stage, which is meningitis. The infection leaves the bone and enters the brain. And now you're dead. You take a dirt nap. Okay, meningitis is lethal. Meningitis will kill you. So otitis media can be turn lethal if not treated. It's upper respiratory infection, retracted eardrum, serous fluid behind the drum, turns pus filled. It could turn into mastoiditis. Infl inflammation of the mastoid bone if left untreated, number six, meningitis, because the roof of the middle ear space is an eighth of an inch from the brain. So all of that taken into consideration, it's important that we take note of it. Treatment for otitis media, antibiotics, pressure equalizing tubes, and actually tonsillectomy.
many times doing a tonsillectomy stops the tonsils from being swollen and closing the eustachian tube. Another pathology is otosclerosis. We talked about that a little while ago. Let's see if I've got a picture of good old otosclerosis. That's not as common as otitis media. Otitis media is really, really common. Here's otosclerosis. Now, don't worry about these dot, the dotted line here. Forget that. Here's an eardrum, malleus, incus, stapes. Look at the bony growth around the foot plate of the stapes. That's a soft, porous bone surrounding the foot plate of the stapes. They call that otosclerosis, meaning hardening. But that's a stupid name. It should be called otoporosis. Okay, just like women can get osteoporosis, softening of the spinal, of the, of the, of the back. Uh, uh, so at any rate, but they, call it, they called it otosclerosis, but it's actually a soft, porous bone surrounding the foot plate of the stapes. The treatment for it is, you, it's very hereditary, hereditary as ever, and they often do a stapedectomy. And if you see this picture, you can see they took out the stapes and they put a titanium wire into a blob of fat. And that's your, now your oval window. Instead of having a stapes in your oval window, they took out the stapes, a stapedectomy. Here's your round window still. Here's your cochlea. Here's your balance organs. But now they did a stapedectomy as treatment for oto. Sclerosis. It is more common in Caucasians than any other race. It is hereditary. If mom or dad has it, chances are the kids are going to get it. Usually hits you when you're an adult. Usually does not hit you when you're a child. It's an adult hearing disorder. And they'll start getting hearing loss. It usually hits both ears, otosclerosis. Sometimes people elect not to do the stapedectomy surgery. Sometimes people elect to do, to just simply wear hearing aids. I know a woman who has otosclerosis in both ears and she says, heck no, I'm not going for surgery. It'll probably ruin my ears, probably make it worse. She just wears hearing aids and she's fine. Okay, but that's, that's the second most, that's the second problem of the middle ear. The biggest one is otitis media. That's the main one. Okay, hit good old escape here. Go back to your notes. So otosclerosis. Mostly Caucasian. If a woman has otosclerosis, it'll get worse when she's pregnant because the little, uh, what do you call it, the, the, the little parasite, I mean fetus, is drawing, is stealing calcium from mummy. And when you're stealing calcium from mummy, now she's gone even more prone to having that soft, bony tissue surrounding the foot plate of the stapes. Treatment is stapedectomy or hearing aids. A third one is a weird one called cholesteatoma. Now, cholesteatoma is a benign, fast-growing tumor of the middle ear space. See, hey, can, you, can you tell I, I'm living in Canada? Look how we spell tumor, O-U-R. In the States, it's just T-U-M-O-R, not here. Tumor, let's get that O-U, or spell color like that, and neighbor like that, and harbor like that. We can't help it. Anyway, a benign, fast-growing tumor of the middle ear space. You don't have to memorize that it's a squamous epithelial carcinoma, who cares? But it begins with a long-standing perforation at the edge of an eardrum. It could be that the child had lots of otitis media, and lots of otitis media, eventually, sometimes the eardrum ruptured due to the bulging of the eardrum. It might have blown, and the perforation didn't heal right, especially if the perforation is near the edge of the eardrum. So if you're thinking of, let's say, I can't I'll show you something that's here. I got something. So let's say you're looking at an ear, you're looking at the at an eardrum dead on. Let's say the perforation is at the edge. I don't mean a perforation like a hole here, but the perforation is at the edge of the eardrum. Often those do not heal well. 
If they don't heal well, the body strives to make new cells to fill in that hole, and it ends up creating a tumor. And that tumor may be benign, that's not a malignant tumor, but guess what? It's going to fill up that middle ear space like nobody's business. So let's take a peek at what a, a cholesteatoma will look like, because if you are diagnosed with a cholesteatoma, I'm telling you, they schedule your butt into surgery fast. They get that out of the middle ear, because that too can invade the brain. Remember, the roof of your middle ear space is an eighth of an inch from the bottom of your brain. So the cholesteatoma will be seen not as otitis media, but that doctors can recognize it. They'll look at it and go, oh, that's not good. Okay, we got to get that out. So cholesteatoma. Hey, osteoma. I get that from a song. Hey, osteoma. This is called swimmer's ear. Women get this from swimming in cold water. Women swim in cold water better than men do. Usually women can do these long distance swims across one of the Great Lakes or they'll win prizes for doing stuff like that. But some men get it too. But the point is, these are bony tumors of the ear canal. This is the ear canal. You're looking at the eardrum and you can see these big bumps in the ear canal. That's nature's way of trying to protect the eardrum from getting so cold. And there'll be bony tumors, and they are easily removed. They are not dangerous to your health. They just look ugly, okay? And a doctor can go in and remove them. Osteoma. So we've covered otitis media as the main pathology, otosclerosis as another pathology, but not nearly as common. It's hereditary. Cholesteatoma, osteoma, they all have oma in them. Whenever you see oma, it doesn't mean German or Dutch for grandmother, okay? Oma and opa, uh-uh. Oma means tuma, <laughs> all right? It usually means that. Okay, let's go to your notes. We're almost done here, just about finished. Here's another one. This one's weird. Patulous or patent eustachian tubes. These are eustachian tubes that never close. Remember we said the eustachian tubes are like government offices, closed and less forced open? This is the opposite. These eustachian tubes are open. They're not, they don't close. Well, that's a bummer because that'll happen in people who've lost weight rapidly. And now their throat has so little fat lining that the eustachian tube isn't naturally closed when not swallowing. Who gets this? Women who've been on crash diets, bulimia, you know, like eating disorders, people trying to lose weight too fast, or people who've been on chemotherapy who've had cancer. You suffered a lot of weight loss. And what's the symptom of patulous or patent eustachian tubes? Hearing your own voice really loud like in a barrel because the sound of your own voice is going right up into your, uh, into your middle ears through your open eustachian tubes. Not common, but that's another pathology of the middle ear. We'll cover these pathologies next year or next semester in a course called Hearing Disorders. Actually, Hearing Disorders is offered in the summers, only in the summer semester at OTC. So this coming summer, I'll see you again, and we'll be talking about all the pathologies of the ear. But this brings us to a close of the middle ear. <sighs> anyway, so we've covered a whole bunch of stuff. All of it was lies. No, just kidding. So we've covered some disorders. You covered acoustic reflexes. We covered the resonances of the middle ear here. We've talked about the maximum conductive hearing loss being caused when the oval and round windows can't trade movement with each other that way. I think I showed you the picture of that over here. So, I mean, it's all these little things that you saw that in this picture over here. Okay, we've covered some physiology of the middle ear going up the page here, how it overcomes the impedance mismatch. What does that word impedance mismatch? Let's just make sure we understand that. 
Okay? Impedance means opposition. So sound traveling through air hits water. If you have your head under a swimming pool and I'm talking to you, there's going to be an impedance mismatch. My airborne sound is going to bounce off the water. And it's the same thing would happen with airborne sound hitting the cochlea. It would bounce off the fluid-filled cochlea. That is why you have a middle ear, to overcome the impedance mismatch between air and fluid. And it overcomes that impedance mismatch in three ways, as we've just, discussed, just talked about today and last week. Okay? And we talked about the Rene tuning fork test. So all of that stuff, there you've got your muscles again under the anatomy. If you look earlier, you'll see the two middle ear muscles. Okay, those are the muscles in the acoustic reflex. And anyways, all the stuff that we covered last week. So okay, that's itsky pitsky for today in middle ear. Next week, we will start on the anatomy of the inner ear. And the following week, we'll do anatomy of the inner ear. And then it's midterm time, and then we'll cover physiology of the inner ear for two weeks, and then eighth nerve, central auditory nervous system, and all of that jazz. Anyway, let me just go back to stop sharing screen, so you have to look at my ugly mug again. Okay, any questions? <laughs> yeah, not for now. She says, as soon as you hang up, I'll have a dozen. All righty, hope you get better. You behave yourself. I'll try not to. All right. <laughs> Cheers. No promises. No promises. Okay. We'll see you all later. Okay. Bye-bye.